I don't know if you can see the picture up there on the, up on the screen very clearly or not. It's one of the, I would consider, more comical renditions of a moment in history referred to as the Diet of Worms. Happened in Germany. Uh, we, in our English-speaking and American reading, have often looked at the Diet of Worms printed out and thought that it was pronounced, pronounced Diet of Worms. And we're going, what in the world is a diet of worms? That does not sound appetizing at all. And why are all those old guys in the picture? Um, no, it's not a different way of eating, trying to get us to eat less beef. No one is proposing a diet of worms. Well, actually, there are some people, but ignore them. That's ridiculous. Um, the diet of worms was the official hearing, and that's what a diet is, it is a official hearing of the accusations against Martin Luther after he filed his 95 theses, his 95 points of disagreement and question of the Catholic Church in Württemberg, Germany. Years later, the Emperor Leo assembled the Diet of Worms to hear this out, and it was ruled that Martin Luther was a heretic, a divisive individual who needed to be excommunicated for his sin and error. And as we begin a conversation about our role in the kingdom, we're talking about how is it that we confront sin, Satan, and a world of darkness. And so the idea of church discipline often gets turned into this conversation, and that's what we're going to look at. The excommunication of Martin Luther, because we are part of the Protestant tradition, we would go, oh, they should not have done that. That was a major error on the part of the Catholic Church and, and, and Emperor Leo for excommunication of Martin Luther just because he had these questions. They were important questions. Is salvation based on grace through the Pope? Or is salvation by growth, grace alone through faith alone? And we would go, he was right. Why did they kick him out? They should have answered his questions. They were legitimate. And if you start going down through church history, you find that there are numerous divisions in the opinion as to who was right and who was wrong because church discipline brought to a point and a question and one group decided baptism of adults was important, baptism of infants was not, and there was a split, and there was another split, and splits got ridiculous. We're very familiar with the Amish tradition, the Amish way of handling church discipline, and because we're not Amish, it's easy for us to look at the idea of shunning just because somebody disagrees with the bishop and his way of handling it. We go, that's just wrong. That's just silly. Why do they do that? And yet, in our tradition, we get to the point of going, okay, if there was an error in the church, what is the right way of handling it? And because we are reluctant to actually utilize what the Bible teaches about how to handle church and spiritual discipline, we end up doing nothing. And we just wait till there's been enough shaming going on that people leave in discomfort and we lose large sections of the congregation because, well, they just didn't treat us with any kind of respect and so we left. Is that any better than a mishandled excommunication? We have problems with the whole thing. And part of it is the way we use the language and understand what it was that Jesus said. And we're going to be looking particularly at Matthew chapter 18, the verses 15 through 20. But this is part of a larger conversation of how it is that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is a kingdom of equals from the least to the greatest. From the youngest child to the oldest grandpa, 
We are equal at the foot of the cross. And how do we maintain that in a group of people who are all broken, all prone to sin, and how do we confront sin within the church, especially when it brings about a breakdown in fellowship and trust? So that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 18, but we need to recognize that we first of all need to understand that our words for being in the kingdom has this idea that, no, we know we're supposed to confront sin, and we've got all these things. Is it a battle against the evil one, or is it just evil? Is there a person behind this? Is there not a person behind this? What is the will of God? How do we understand that? And if we understand that there is a will of God, we must understand that there are a variety of words that we use to talk about the opposite or that which takes away from the will of God. So when we pray, your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, understanding God's will also means understanding and being able to talk about the things that are not God's will. And when is it important to shun, to shame? Is shame a good thing? Are there things we should shun? Are there situations when somebody should be removed from the fellowship of believers? These are all important questions. We are called to take these stands against sin and the opposite of God's will. And Jesus did teach us how to do that because how we do it is important. You remember James and John at one point, Jesus had left a town because there wasn't very much faith there. He wasn't able to do very much healing. And James and John, I vision it this way, James and John were walking with the twelve a little bit behind Jesus when they had this brilliant idea because they've been talking about Elijah. And they go trotting up to Jesus and goes, Lord, would you like for us to call down fire from heaven to punish these people for their sin? And Jesus is going, um, no, boys, calm down. This will be, th that is not the how to confront sin. This will be dealt with in time my way. We know that Paul in Ephesians reminds us that our battle is not, is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, principalities, powers of the air, spiritual forces of darkness are out there. They are real. Jesus drove out demons. There were things that he taught about these spiritual forces that are out there and where the source of power comes from ultimately for us through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, where through the resurrection he proved his superiority over all of those powers. And now we work through the history of God finally bringing all things in submission to Christ before his return. And we are part of that working through the process of bringing things under Christ's control. And so, Paul also, though he says our battle is not against flesh and blood, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he rebukes the church in Corinth because there was sexual immorality of a particularly heinous sort going on in the church, and the church had not said anything about it. In fact, there was some indication that they actually bragged about how open-minded they were about all this sexual revolution stuff, and this was 2,000 years ago. It hasn't been taking place since the 60s. It's been pl taking place since the year 60. Not any numbers before that. You know, it's been going on, and we are called to confront, and Jesus does show us how. And in this passage in Matthew is one of the most concise teachings that Jesus brings us about confronting sin. But it's not the kind of sin that you're thinking. It's not every sin. Let's read it together. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault, just between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you and go back to him, so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them as well, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, 
let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. The, the King James uses the word, let him be unto you as a heathen or publican. That's very confusing, especially with our word republican. We're not sure exactly what King James meant, but uh, here the English translation is Gentile and tax collector, perhaps a little bit more helpful. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And again, in our conversation on how to pray, the idea of asking the Father in the name of the Son was something we talked about, having first understood what the will of God is, then ask your heart's desire, because you are in alignment with the Father's will. And so these are some of the things that we need to have in mind. And, and so the principle is fairly straightforward and simple. You go, well, that's not hard to understand. I don't know why there's been so much difficulty about it. It's a relatively simple formula. First, go privately. Explain the sin, right? And if there is no humility, there is no agreement, then go back with a witness. We're not talking about a witness that, oh, yes, that's exactly what they said. The idea of the witness is for clarity. Maybe it's just that you understand the sin differently than I understand the sin, and we are having a breakdown in communication. The witnesses go along so that discreetly we can keep this on the lowdown and just sort through it. But then if there's still no agreement, no humility, then we go public with it. And in going public, the objective is to reach a consensus, reach an agreement, because the idea is to work the problem, not the person. Here's where we make one of our biggest mistakes is that we think it's about getting the sinner to stop sinning. But the issue of sin is that it's a sin against you. Not even necessarily a sin against God. Anything that disrupts your ability to trust the group is a sin that might eventually need to be brought to the church. And so the idea is don't take it personally. Don't get angry. This is not a situation where you're trying to prove which of you has the most support from the church this is an issue where we're working through the problem to bring us back to a point of trust and unity for the sake of the power of the kingdom at work in us because we are one with each other and one with Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit. It is the issue of unity that needs to be restored, not the issue of deciding who's right and wrong about what sin really is. And so we get down to some of these critical words because we find that when this simple formula is manipulated improperly or in a way that causes conflict, all sorts of things can blow up and the fallout can last for generations from that time of the blow up that took place. We are still dealing with a 500 year old blow up from the Dia to Worms. There is no peace. We've reached maybe a ceasefire. But there's no unity. We laugh at them, they laugh at us. There's no unity within the church institutional writ large across the planet because of a bad issue that happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And so let's look at a couple of key words and how we hear them differently than what Jesus was saying and come to a misunderstanding of Jesus' core teaching on how to confront sin. First of all, the word church. This is the first occurrence of the word church being used, the word ecclesia. Jesus here is quoted by uh, Matthew, and so we're going to give Jesus credit for being the first one to grab this Greek word, ecclesia, and bring it into the kingdom vocabulary 
And the word ekklesia was used by the Greeks long before Jesus used it. He didn't coin the phrase. And for them, who were familiar with a city-state form of government, not an empire, but each large city had the area around, and they governed themselves through the various forms, sometimes senators, sometimes kings, sometimes this, sometimes that, but it was with the idea that the citizenry as a whole worked together in agreement to form the, the government that ruled that city-state. And occasionally, if they didn't have a standing army, and another city-state was threatening their crops or property, they would call for an ecclesia of the men of fighting age, arm them, equip them, and send them to recover the Queen of Troy. Uh, yeah, Helen of Troy, right? And they would, they would pull together a group of people to accomplish a mission, a task, and when the mission or task was accomplished, the ecclesia was dissolved. It wasn't a standing group. It was a group of the citizens that were appropriate to accomplish the task. Sometimes it was about putting out fires. Sometimes it was about making decisions. Sometimes it was a matter of what are we going to do about the crops. There were all kinds of ecclesia that were called. It was not a standing group. It was oriented to the mission. And so keep that in mind as you hear Jesus saying, take this to the church. He may not be talking about the way we think about the definition of church. Our definition of church usually goes to we own property together. We have a 501c3 status. The IRS recognizes that we have to have a form of government in which one person is not holding sole decision-making power over the expenditures and the property, the disposition of property. Our definition of church is institutional, not what Jesus was referring to in regard to a task that they were to accomplish. That doesn't mean that this is not a church. It just means that we need to be thinking about and very clear about what is it that Christ has called us together to do as the ecclesia in this town on this day for these people. What does ecclesia mean for us it needs to stay in our focus and it doesn't have to do with the sign that we post out front, the structure of leadership our habits and practices on a single day, we are ecclesia because of the calling. That means that when it comes to a sin, the sin in Jesus' reference here is the idea that there are a variety of things that will cause you to not trust the people who are gathered together. Um, if the... If the just pulling an example out of the air, ridiculous example. If an ecclesia has been called to pull a horse and buggy out of a ditch, and one of the people, horse is still doing just fine, it's just stuck, and one of the people goes to the truck and gets a gun, you would immediately say, I don't trust what that person is going to do. If he had pulled out a rope, I'd say appropriate, good. But he pulled out a gun, and so it's my job to say, um, you know, the 15 of us were just going to grab the horse and buggy and pull them out of the ditch. What's the gun for, brother? Oh, well, you know, I'm afraid the, the horse has hurt his leg, so I'm just going to go ahead and put it down. Hmm, you're not a veterinary. This is not your area of gifting. Just because you happen to have a tool, let's not use it. This is the idea that should be in our minds when it comes to a sin against you might not be a sin against God. Let that sink in. Because our habit of thinking would say that we are dealing with issues of sin. It's like the Corinth situation. It's sexual immorality. It's defining what political party is right and wrong. It's deciding all sorts of things that are an affront to God, and that's what church discipline is all about. 
don't think that's what Jesus is saying here at all. If I called you together for a purpose, anything that violates that purpose might be something that you need to address because you recognize it first. Here is a good example of something that I think we did pretty well. COVID, right? Nothing mentioned in the Bible about COVID, so we're not talking about a sin against God. And there was a lot of talk about wearing masks. There was a lot of talk about isolation. And we said being isolated from one another is not acceptable. We still want to get together as quickly as we can figure out how, and we bought a little AM radio transmitter. And we ecclesia we gathered some in here, and very quickly, a lot in the parking lot. We gathered, we figured out the logistics of it, we moved forward to continue meeting together. As we came inside, there was a discussion, masks, wear them or don't wear them. Can we get by with our group not violating the trust of the group? We've got some gathering outside. We love them. We care for them. We're meeting their needs. And if they come inside, if they're wearing a mask, we will also have masks. I still, to this day, right here, I carry it with me all the time, not because I often put it on, but if at any moment I feel that somebody else would be more comfortable with my love for them, if I put it on, not a problem. I'll put it on. I don't resent them for making me wear a mask. I'm not compromised in my freedom because it's my choice. I think we hit a good point of being able to say, oh, here's how we read when I might be sinning against a brother or sister. If they come in wearing a mask, I'm going to assume that I should put mine on too so that I do not sin against them. Nowhere in the Bible that says you must wear a mask. We realize that this has been going on forever. People at various times have various issues of health and space. Our personal space used to be arm's distance, right? Stay out of the bubble, we're gonna get along fine. If I want to violate your space, I'll reach out my hand and we'll shake hands that's good. But there were always those people who wanted to talk to you right here, who wanted to violate your space because their idea of personal space was much smaller than a typical. And now it's gone to a double arm's distance. And now I can say, you know what? If I can smell your breath, good or bad, you are probably too close. Because our personal space has gotten larger due to COVID, and some, you know, still step within the arm space, and I go, oh, they're awfully close now. And if that is causing me distrust in the relationship, I don't take it to the church. I don't call down fire from heaven. I say, mm, can we maybe not stand so close together? You have a little bit of a cough and a sniffle, and whether it's COVID or not, I don't want whatever you got. And so we redefine what our boundaries are, but this fits into the definition of a sin against you that the simplest thing to do is to say, hey, you have a habit of catching a cold and still coughing in my direction. It really bugs me. And if the person is offended at having been confronted and they're very arrogant they might go well i'm free to cough where i want i was just swinging my arms the fact that it hit you is your fault not mine i tried that my parents didn't actually think that that was an adequate solution um, and uh, but we have all sorts of ways of going oh well maybe we misunderstand the idea of freedom, the idea of love, the idea of personal space. And so let me get somebody else. Mom, Steve says he can just swing his arms wherever he wants, and if he hits me in the face, it's okay. Yeah, no, Steve, that, that really doesn't work. You, you need to stop swinging your arms. But this is what Jesus is saying. I'm making it comical, but it can be very serious implications about how we handle things within the fellowship of the ecclesia 
and how we ratchet up very simply and all the time so that when mom says, hey, we're all sitting down at dinner while we're all together. Let me just be clear on the swinging of arms policy. No. If you are outside, you can swing your arms, but inside, no swinging of arms. Now we've brought it to the whole church, the whole ecclesia that was gathered together to accomplish family. But this is the way Jesus is talking about the church, not as an institution, but as a group of people who are called out to accomplish the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. And so we deal with things very simply that way. The idea of the heathen and publican is confusing, and it's not saying punish them, rebuke them, make them feel shame. That's not the issue. It's just saying, hey, we never could resolve this thing. And the people who want to walk by faith alone, in Christ alone, achieving God's grace alone, we release them to do that because it is disruptive to the fellowship. We are not condemning them to hell. We are not getting in the way of God's grace. This is not an issue of discipline or you know, the whole idea of binding on earth as it is in heaven. This judgment isn't about sending them to hell because they're not in the church anymore. We don't have to be confused on any of that. We're just saying, treat them like an outsider. If we were Amish, if Jesus had been Amish, he would have said, treat them like the English or maybe a Mennonite driver. They're not bad people, in many ways very useful people, but they're not us. And so recognize that they are not us. Confronting sin is more than just a church discipline issue where we're trying to drive people out. Once you understand the mission, you understand that there is an issue of esprit de corps, what we used to call in the army, esprit de corps, the spirit of the group. And there are things that are important for that, but they're not sin. Just because they're important to the fellowship doesn't mean that God needs to be bound in heaven to feel as strongly about them as we do. Have you noticed the guys that have on their cars this little blue or black circle? It looks like a lion. It's for a group called Fight Club. It is a group of men, predominantly. I think there is a women's but men from the Goshen Church up in, in uh, Goshen, uh, Grace Church, they've got a men's group that's highly disciplined. They go through a regular process, and it's very athletic. It's very self-discipline oriented. But these guys, when they get done, they've gone through a round of fight club, and now they are permitted to put that sticker on their car, and the fight club people recognize these are part of our fellowship. This is part of our group. It builds the spirit of the group to have these things. Um, I'm looking into getting little church logo things to put on a shirt. You know, you could put it on a hat if you wanted. But building up the community is a good and healthy thing for a group that does things and acts together. To be able to recognize that and talk about it, that's a good thing. But it's not an issue of sin in that regard. It's an issue of morale and trust and fellowship. And if somebody from Fight Club saw somebody else from Fight Club walking out of a bar drunk and disorderly, they'd be going, that's a sin against me. Because you bring down my whole group by presenting that out in public. And so dealing with that doesn't mean that it has to be a whole thing in church discipline, but it is confronting a sin against you. And so in confronting sin, it's more than just church discipline. It's more than just going, okay, we're just trying to get to the point of going, is this a situation where we can excommunicate, we can shun, we can shame them, we just need to get to deal with how do we treat that person? That's not the objective. And in fact, you may be violating the confronting of sin because you now have sinned by making the whole environment of the group feel like, oh man, got to walk on eggshells around this group. I can't, I can't say the wrong word at the wrong time. I can't, I can't possibly talk about a 
favorite adult beverage in the group or slip that I didn't shun somebody or shame them in the right way, you know, the whole smoking deal. And a lot of our experience in the church has been trying to figure out within our group what are the things that we have to shun and shame and what are the things that we can let ride. Can I mention that I saw an R-rated movie? Can I mention that I played cards with uh, face cards the other night? Can I mention the fact that my husband and I went dancing? Different groups may have issues that are part of their culture, but it's not a really an issue of sin before God. The, the objective of church of confronting sin and church discipline is to maintain the idea of spiritual unity. That's the objective. Work the problem, not the person. In the battle between God and evil, there are only two sides. There are not different sides for every single denomination, church affiliation, heritage, and style of building out there. There are only we get confused because of all of the church discipline and confronting this disruptive sin that breaks the trust and fellowship of the group is not about punishing them. It preserves the spiritual unity of that group. That's its only objective. It's not to decide the conscience of every individual as to whether or not playing cards are sin. It is to decide at what point is our fellowship needing to step in because of the mission God has given to us. Our united power to overcome evil comes from God and the cross. Because there's only two sides, imagine if it was World War II and the Allied forces had complete distribution power over all the ammo for the NATO side. And so you would have to say, Yes, I'm a part of NATO, I can have ammo in order to fight. It would be ridiculously inconvenient, but it's kind of that way in regard to the kingdom where we are united to God, the Father, through Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, and that becomes the power through which we are able to confront sin. And so when Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, it's a matter of going two or three can very quickly and informally identify themselves as an ecclesia called by Christ to accomplish a mission. And as soon as the mission is done, the ecclesia can be dissolved. No big deal. And so open up our thinking about how it is that we confront for the sake of accessing the will of God to accomplish the mission of God and the work of God and how are we oriented as a group as small as two or three as large as 50 as large as 500 as large as 50,000 or 50 million if we are called by Christ to accomplish the kingdom purposes anything that disrupts that can be handled as an issue of sin that violates the collective unity before God. The main point of all of this is that Jesus did teach his disciples how to confront sin, Satan, and the spiritual powers of darkness. Jesus taught his disciples to confront anything that disrupts that as sin, but do it privately first, then discreetly with a witness, then publicly to protect the spiritual unity not to punish the person, but to collectively come to a consensus on how we're going to deal with this disruption to our unity, but to protect the spiritual unity of those who are called to work together in accomplishing God's will. This is when confronting sin as a church becomes important, not to shun, shame, or excommunicate somebody, but for clarity on this is how we stand together for the cause of Christ. It's a little bit different than the way we've usually thought about this verse, isn't it? We think Jesus is setting up a procedural order so that we can decide who needs to be excommunicated. He's actually doing something very much different. And the something different that he's doing is establishing a way 
that we can always link back to our core identity of knowing him personally and allowing him to call us together to do things. Sometimes it is to maintain a property and a collection of ministries on an ongoing basis in a community. Sometimes it's as quick and as easy as pulling your Amish neighbor's horse and buggy out of a ditch. That also is ecclesia done in the name of Christ. Once the horse is gone and the buggy's fine and the neighbors feel loved by Christ, the ecclesia can be dissolved. But it's all about knowing who we believe and who we follow, the person of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together and sing this song that clarifies that core identity for us again. I know whom I have believed.